Dear students, let us continue the discussion of uh, chapter number 21 uh, that is case study of uh, the Linux system. Okay. So, uh, today we will see the concept of memory management and all. So, how exactly the memory management is carried out in Linux system. So, we know that memory means uh, again uh, it may be the physical memory or it may be the virtual memory. So let us see how the physical memory is uh, handled and how virtual memory is handled in Linux operating system. So as given here, the Linux's physical memory management system deals with uh, allocating and freeing pages, groups of pages and small blocks of uh, memory. So again to handle the physical memory, the Linux is having a separate uh, physical memory management system and that deals with the memory in terms of the pages. So it uh, it is responsible for uh, performing the allocation and uh, deallocation that is freeing of pages, the grouping of pages and uh, into the small box of the memory. So similarly, uh, it is having the additional mechanisms for handling the virtual memory also, which is a memory mapped into the address space of the running processes. So the memory management is going to split the memory into three different zones due to the hardware characteristics okay so let us see what are these three different zones we have so here we have the relationship of the three zones and the physical addresses on a particular example system that is uh, 80x86 so here it's very uh, clearly given that uh, in the first column we have the zones and the second column we have the physical memory range so as we saw, it is going to split the memory into three zones, zone underscore DMA, zone underscore normal and zone underscore IMM. So here the first one that is zone underscore DM. So this will be occupied by the first 16 MB of the physical memory. So on the systems, the first 16 MB of physical memory is going to come uh, be used by the zone DM. Okay. So after this, from 16 MB to 696 ME, it is occupied by the second region or second zone that is zone normal. Okay. And above that, that is above 6, uh, 896 MB, the next is zone high MM. So in this way, uh, the memory is split into the three zones and on 8086, these are the possible ranges. So here, on uh, Linux system, uh, the uh, prime physical memory manager is the page allocator. So in every zone, a separate uh, page allocator will be there and it is taking care of allocating and freeing up the physical pages for that particular zone. And it is also uh, capable of allocating the ranges of physically continuous pages as per the request okay so along with this uh, we have one more uh, concept that is the allocator is you uh, going to use a buddy system so here in this uh, figure uh, you can see how exactly the splitting of uh, memory is carried out in the buddy heap or buddy system so why this name buddy came here so here it uh, uh, whenever uh, we have the number of uh, units of the memory so what happens here is so whenever the number of uh, uh, free units are there so nearby units are clubbed into one to form the larger units so that's why we call this concept as the buddy heap so the same you can see here so the whole 16 kb is divided and split into the two sub uh, regions that is 8 kb and 8 kb so further, this 8 KB can be subdivided into 2 4 KB and 4 KB. So this is how the splitting of memory takes place in the buddy heap. So that's what here the whenever required. So here if you want 8 KB, so this nearby if these are two, uh, these both are free. So these will be combined to form an 8 KB and so on. So in this way, uh, the splitting of uh, memory takes place on the per day system okay so whatever the discussion we had the same is given here we just go through this and uh, the one more important uh, 
point with respect to the memory management on Linux system is the slab allocator. So especially for the kernel memory, your Linux system is going to use the slab allocator. So this is given here. So the slab allocator means as the name itself indicates, the memory will be handled in terms of the slab. Okay. So usually a slab is used for allocating the memory for kernel data structures and it is made up of one or more physically contiguous pages. So a cache consists of one or more slabs and there is a single cache for each unique kernel data structure. So for example, a cache for the data structure representing the process descriptors. So here you can see, so to deal with the kernel memory requirements, so the system is going to use the concept of slab here. So you can see the number of slabs are there and if required, it is going to form the contiguous slabs and corresponding to this we will be having the catches also. So these catches are going to deal with the individual kernels data structures. The example is it may be for a particular file descriptor. Okay. So, so in Linux, a slab may be one of the three possible states. So a slab may be in the full state, it may be empty or it may be partial. So if a slab is full, then all objects in the slab are marked as used. So here you can see here this is a full means all the objects are marked as used. You cannot make use of this particular slab. Similarly, empty. Empty means all objects in this slab are marked as free. So one more state is partial. So here this slab consists of both used and free objects. So here we have the combination of these two. So this is about the memory management. So next we'll see the virtual memory. So as we saw along with the physical memory, the system will be having the virtual memory. This is an additional memory which will be uh, a direct address mapping. Okay. So here uh, the virtual memory system maintains the address space visible to each process. It creates a pages of uh, the virtual memory on demand and manages the loading of those pages from disk or their swapping back into the uh, into as required. So here again to deal with this virtual memory we have the virtual manager virtual memory manager and it maintains the two separate views of the processes address space so that is logical view and physical view a logical view describes the instructions concerning the layout of the address space there are physical view uh, of each address space which is stored in the hardware page tables for the process okay so after this the Virtual memory regions are again characterized by a backing store which describes from where the pages for a region come. Okay. And regions are usually backed by a file or by nothing. So regions reaction to write. So these are the two characteristics of uh, the virtual memory regions. First one is the backing store and second one is the regions reactions. So the kernel is going to create a new virtual address space whenever a new process is created and when you call an access system call. Okay. So this is given here. So on executing a new program, the process is given a new completely empty virtual address space as we saw in the previous slide. Okay. So uh, creating a new process with four involves creating a complete copy of the existing processes virtual address space. So what all things will be done whenever a new process is created by the fork which uh, creates a complete new copy of the virtual memory. So first the kernel copies the parents uh, VMA descriptors and then creates a new set of page tables for the child. After that, the parents page tables are copied directly into the child's with the reference count of each page covered being incremented. So after the fork, the parent and child share the same physical pages of memory in their address spaces. So in this way, whenever a new process is called uh, created by using the fork, altogether a new virtual address space will be created for the child and the corresponding things will be carried out in this way. So along with this uh, in the Linux kernel, 
This was a constant uh, architecture dependent region of the virtual address space of every process for its uh, own internal use. Okay. So this kernel virtual memory area, it contains again two regions that is static area and the remaining area. So a static area contains the page table references to every available physical page of memory in the system means here whatever the pages are there so for every available physical the static area contains a separate page table so there is a simple translation of the physical to virtual addresses when running a kernel code okay so apart from this the remainder of the reserved section is not reserved for any specific purpose so its page table entries can be modified to point out any other areas of the memory so that's what the kernel virtual memory area contains the two regions the first area is the static area where for every page a separate page table is maintained to deal with that and the remaining is there is no specific page table and it is also possible to change the contents of the page table as and when required so after this we'll discuss executing and loading the user programs so we know that whenever you write a program in order to execute that the first the program should be loaded and when you start executing a program a separate process is created so in the same way here to deal with this also the linux maintains a separate table of functions for loading the programs and it gives each function the opportunity to try loading the given file when an access system call is made so that's what we saw whenever you create a new child process you have to call xx system call in order to start executing that program okay so the registration of multiple loader routines allows linux to support both elf and a dot out binary formats so here we have two formats in linux the one is elf and another one is a dot out binary form so the registration of multiple loader routines is going to allow linux to support both these formats so initially binary file pages are mapped into the virtual memory and elf uh, format binary file consists of a header followed by the several page aligned sections so uh, next we'll see the memory layout of the elf uh, programs so here uh, you can see uh, the above part we have uh, so that's what uh, here in the above part we have uh, the kernel virtual memory so which is completely hidden from the user mode so that's what here given the memory invisible to the user mode code so uh, already we know the dual mode of operation of the operating system so the virtual me kernel memory virtual memory already we discussed in the previous slide so this is only accessible for the kernel this is uh, completely invisible to the user mode so after this whatever the remaining memory part is there so this entire party can be used both by the kernel and the user so here as usual we have stack after that we have heap and after that we have the memory mapped regions and after this again we have a particular examples memory address space and so on so in this way the memory layout of uh, the elf program will be uh, there so after this we'll discuss the static kind of dynamic linking so here uh, so just uh, just blank this so a program whose necessary library functions are embedded directly in the program's executable binary file is statically linked to its libraries so already you are aware of the static kind of dynamic okay so a program whose necessary uh, in the program the necessary library functions will be there so these will be embedded directly in the program's executable binary file statically whereas dynamic linking is more efficient and in terms of both physical and uh, disk space usage because it loads the system libraries into memory one only once whenever it starts execution so this is about the static kind uh, dynamic linking next we have uh, the file systems so we know that in linux everything is considered as a file even a particular device is also considered as a file so to the user linux file system appears as a hierarchical directory tree obeying a unix semantics so internally the kernel hides the implementation details and manages the multiple different file systems via 
an abstraction layer that is the virtual file system so along with the physical uh, file system we have an abstraction of the physical file system on above that we have the virtual file system and usually uh, when we have this virtual file system so uh, the implementation part is hidden from the user and uh, we have only uh, the representation of the files in the form of a directory structure so uh, the linux vfs uh, is designed around object oriented principles and is composed of the two components the first one is the set of definitions that define what an object uh, what a file object is allowed to look like and second one is the layer of software to manipulate those objects okay so under this again uh, see this uh, a VFS is going to define the four main object types. So here, the first one is inode object, second one is file object, third one is super block object, and fourth one is entry object. So here, inode object represents an individual file, uh, file object represents an open file, super block object represents an entire file system, and entry object represents an individual directory entry. Okay, so. In this way, uh, the VFS is going to deal with the corresponding file system. So here we'll uh, discuss the Linux ext2fs file system. So it's a special case. So the ext2fs uses a mechanism similar to that of the BSD fast file system uh, FFS uh, for locating data blocks belonging to a specific file. So that's what uh, we saw that although we are discussing Linux file system, but the base is on the Unix file system only and the Unix is supported by the BS. Okay, so BSD's fast file system is uh, similar to that of the XT2FS uh, file system that is implemented on the Linux file system. So the main differences between this EXT2FS and the FFS concern their disk allocation policy. So we'll just uh, glance the differences here. So in FFS, the disk is allocated to files in blocks of 8 KB with blocks being subdivided into fragments of 1 KB to store small files or partially filled blocks at the end of a file. Whereas in ext 2 fs does not use the fragments. It performs its allocations in smaller units. The default block size of ext 2 fs is 1 KB although 2 KB and 4 KB blocks are also supported. So this is the difference. Okay, in FFS, the file is allocated in terms of the blocks of 8 KB. Okay, and uh, it is going to subdivide into fragments, but ext 2 fs does not support any fragmentation and it uh, allocates in terms of the smaller units of size 1 KB, 2 KB or 4 KB. And after this, ext 2 fs uses allocation policies designed to place logically adjacent blocks of a file into physically adjacent blocks on disk. So it can submit an IO request for several disk blocks as a single operation. Okay, so this is how the ext 2 fs file system is going to operate. So next we'll see uh, the ext 2 fs block allocation policies. Okay, so here uh, in this figure, so it is very clear. So here each row represents a sequence of the set and unset bits in the allocation bitmap. So here you can see uh, the notations. So the filled block indicates the block in use, the empty indicates free block. So a filled with the dot indicates the block selected by the allocator and the arrow indicates the bitmap search. So here uh, the, this is byte boundary and this is bit boundary. So if it is thick, it is byte boundary. If it is uh, narrow, it is uh, the bit boundary. So here we have two examples. The first one is allocating scattered free blocks and second one is allocating the contiguous free blocks. Okay. So here uh, what happens is in the first case that is in the scattered free blocks, uh, if we can find any free blocks sufficiently near the start of the search, then we may allocate them no matter how fragmented they may be. Okay. So the fragmentation is partially compensated for uh, by the fact that the blocks are close together and can probably all be read without any disk six and allocating them all one file is better uh, in the long run 
than allocating isolated blocks to separate files. So here you can see uh, in allocating scattered free blocks. So here you can see the scattered blocks have been allocated because here we consider that the blocks are, uh, are almost near to each other. We should be allocating the larger amount of uh, blocks at a far place. So it is better to allocate in this way. So this is the first way. The second way that is allocating contiguous free blocks. So in this case, if uh, uh, this uh, if there is a need that if we allow uh, if the it allocation is not possible means here if the contiguous free blocks are not available so here what it does is so it will go on performing the bitmap search until a particular uh, entry is found and whenever an entry is found it will come in the reverse way and it is going to allocate the eight blocks continuously okay so in this way this ext2 fs block allocation policies will work so after this uh, we'll see the linux proc file system so the proc file system does not store data rather its contents are computed on demand according to the user file io request so it's a, a special uh, file system that is used only for the system where the data is not stored so here uh, data is automatically computed on demand means as and when required whenever uh, the file io request uh, arrives so here uh, the proc must implement a directory structure and the file contents within so it must define a unique and persistent inode number for each directory and file it contains so it uses this inode number to identify just what operation is required when a user tries to read from a particular file inode or perform a lookup in a particular directory node so when data is read from one of these files proc collects the appropriate information formats it into text form and places it into the requesting process is read buffer okay so see that's what the proc file system which is mainly used for the system and its data is generated automatically you no need to store the data so after this we have the input and output so the linux device oriented file system accesses this storage through the two caches that is page cache and the buffer cache so uh, the data is cached in page cache which is unified with the virtual memory system and metadata is cached in buffer cache a separate uh, cache indexed by the physical disk block so the linux will split the devices into the three classes that is block devices character devices and the network devices so these will discuss in the next slide so here you can see the device driver block structure so you just uh, glance this so here we have the different components uh, associated with the different type of uh, the devices so we'll discuss the block devices so as the name itself indicates so here the data transmission takes place in terms of the blocks so it provides main interface to all the disk devices in the system so the block buffer catches uh, catches serves two main purposes so it acts as a pool of buffers for the active io and it serves as a cache for the completed io okay so here the block buffer it acts as a pool for the pool of buffers for the active io and it acts as a cache for the completed io so here we have the request manager so it manages the reading and writing of the buffer contents to and from the block device driver so after this we have the character devices as the name itself indicates the data transmission is taken place in terms of the characters one at a time so here a device driver which does not uh, offer the random access to fixed blocks of data a character device driver must register a set of functions which implement the driver's various file io operations and so on so the main exceptions to this rule is uh, the special subset of the character device drivers which implements the terminal devices for which the kernel maintains a standard interface so after this we have the last point of this chapter that is interprocess communication so I think already we have discussed this concept in detail while discussing the concept of the processes. So the interprocess communication means uh, here it is going to facilitate the communication among the processes. So there is a limited number of signals and they cannot carry information. So only the fact that a signal occurred is available to a process. So the Linux kernel does not use signals to uh, communicate with the processes with uh, which are running. Uh, the kernel mode rather communication within the kernel is accomplished via the scheduling states and wait queue structures means here 
in general we saw that uh, the interprocess communication takes place through the signals but the linux kernel does not use signals for interprocess communication it uses uh, it uh, it supports interprocess communication through the scheduling states and the wait queue structures so how exactly a passing of data takes place between the processes so here you have the two mechanisms one is pipe another one is shared memory the pipe is very simple it's like your water pipe only one side you have to put the data and another side the data will be taken off uh, okay so here if the pipe mechanism allows the child process to inherit a communication channel to its parent data return to one end of the pipe and can be read and the other so that's what i told you it's like your uh, water pipe only in the shared memory uh, block of memory will be shared among the processes okay the some processes will be uh, writing the data and others will be reading the data from that particular memory so to obtain the synchronization however the shared memory must be used in conjunction with the another ipc mechanisms so after this we have the shared memory object so here the shared memory object acts as a backing store for the shared memory regions in the same way as a file can act as a backing store for a memory map to memory region so the shared memory mappings direct page faults to map in uh, pages from a persistent shared memory object so the shared memory objects remember their contents even if no processes are currently mapping them into the virtual memory so in general the shared memory object this acts like a backing store for the shared memory region so that whenever uh, there is no content so that time also it will be having the mapping information into the virtual memory so with this uh, we complete chapter number 21 and also we complete module 5 so with this we completed the syllabus of uh, operating system thank you and all the best for your exams